Tech channel and this video is really going to be a little brief look at how I train Zeus, my golden eagle. Enjoy part one of this two part video and don't forget to check out part two. Now, this video isn't going to be a how to train your golden eagle video, uh, not at all. But I thought some of you might like to see or understand some of the key facts or some, some of the key things that went into training Zeus, my golden eagle, and to make him the eagle that he is, and, and the eagle that I wanted him to be, which is quite important because um, I did set out with a plan of action and a plan in my head of what I wanted to produce in, in a golden eagle sort of sense. So first off, oh by the way, I've just actually recorded all of this, uh, probably waffled a bit, um, and then realised that I hadn't pressed record, probably like half an hour of filming, and when you're busy that's really annoying, so a cold real ale was in order to calm my nerves, so I'll continue <laughs> on repeat. <laughs> so, before all my Falkland friends knew I wanted or was seriously thinking about uh, flying a golden eagle, I spent at least two years um, research out in the field with my eagle Falkland friends, the people I'm lucky enough to know that were already flying golden eagles, pioneers, and certainly way before my time. Um, and I didn't tell them because so many people get eagles. You know, for the same reason, they get big aggressive breeds of dogs, really, just to um, have a cute ass or to sort of, I don't know, a macho thing. I think it really is, you know. Um, I used to be into fast motorbikes, and my goodness me, people would buy some of the biggest, most powerful motorbikes uh, that they couldn't ride. Um, you know what it's like with men, you ladies know, you know, what they're trying to sort of, you know, extend and all that. So I didn't want to come across as one of those sort of fly by nights idiots. I was really serious now. I've been flying birds of prey for a very long time by this point. Uh, my, my full career itself was goshawks and a lot of Harris Hawk in, in, in the mix as well over, over many years. But goshawks at the time were really my, the birds of prey that I've been employing for full career. Um, so I was going out with the Eagle guys, tagging along, being part of the field team, and learning as I went, watching, listening, and learning, and talking, because that's what I do, asking a lot of questions. Now, the beauty of hindsight is a fantastic thing. So a lot of my friends would say, oh, I've got this problem with my ego and that's because I did this, but you know, now I can't break the habit and I wish I'd have done this differently. And of course, you know, habits stick with animals very often, but of course I could, I could have their hindsight for my up and coming training, could I? If you like, I could learn from their mistakes. So I wasn't just looking at what was working really well, I was talking to the guys and watching and looking at what was going wrong or what they told me had, had not gone how they wanted. So I could kind of think around now, I was lucky. I was like, you know, they were putting in the work and I could learn from their, their previous hard work for sure. So I formed a plan and what did I want? I wanted a golden eagle that was gonna be bomb proof to everything. I wanted to take him to, to shows and events and educational talks along with the team of birds and him be as relaxed as, as Nigel Maharasov, without a doubt. So I wanted bomb proof uh, in any environment and I wanted a puppy dog eagle, a golden eagle that indeed was like Nigel, my Harris is an eagle that would be beautiful to be around hunting, beautiful to be around when he's eating, and absolutely lovely manners to be around um, when he made a kill, and I was feeding him on his kill, being part of the team, and of course, the all important trade-off. I didn't want any aggression or nasty behavior. Boy, by this time, had I seen some pretty savage eagles, um, when it came to food and, and being oriented around food and their falconers. And I thought, you know, and a lot of people said, no, that's golden eagles, that's how they are. They're just really aggressive. And I thought, I don't know, you know, it's just a ginormous great bird of prey. Yes, eagles are apex predators. Yes, they're inherently far more aggressive and they will defend their kill against anything. So there's that inherent aggression in an eagle. But I didn't feel they had to be horrible aggressive things to work around for sure. Um, and I didn't want that. 
I wanted something that I absolutely adored to be around, like I do with all my falconry birds, and not something that, you know, I, I, I practice falconry with, I'd be caught stuff with, but it was a bit of a handful and, and not very pleasant. I wanted him to be the whole, absolute whole package, the perfect hunting partner forever, should I wish to just fly gold eagles forever, it's gonna outlive me after all. So what did I want? I wanted a well-bred eagle, uh, and the name that kept coming up to me was, in the UK, was George Musserad. He's got a fantastic pair of golden eagles, sadly no more, there's only one of them left, but these birds bred for years and years and years. He was a pioneer eagle man, he's been mentioned in books before I was even born. This guy knows his eagles and he pioneered and really was there at the forefront of breeding golden eagles for sure in captivity. Um, I wanted a small eagle, I wanted a male eagle because uh, female eagles like any bird of prey are the dominant force in the partnership. And when you scale that up to eagles, of course, the dominance can be a little bit overbearing at times with eagles. Um, I wanted a male, and I wanted a male also because they're smaller than the female. And I wanted a small male. I'd be happy, six and a half pounds would have suited me fine. The quarry was always going to be the brown hair, um, the formidable quarry species for a golden eagle. Nature's arms race of eagle and prey, so incredibly difficult to catch, but the most sporting of flights. The, the ultimate quarry for the golden eagle. So I needed something hopefully small and agile to try and match the twisting and the turns and the, just the, the, the ridiculous things that hares can do to evade their predators. Um, but George Musselman's pair were, I believe, wild imports or F1 Kazakhstan uh, goldies, the biggest race in the world. And Zeus ended up flying at about eight and a half to eight and three quarter pounds. His sisters and mum were ginormous compared to that. So instead of getting that, that small, dashing, highly manoeuvrable, tiny male golden eagle I kind of wanted and planned on, I ended up with probably the most beautiful golden eagle in the world, for sure, but a huge great boy, um, a bit of a lump, um, certainly not as agile as my friend's smaller golden eagle males, and we see that in the field even to this day. Um, hairs that will give Zeus a slip, they might well take indeed that smaller and more agile behaviour. Anyway. He's beautiful, and that's the bird I, I bought and the bird I got. Um, so some key things that really helped me, <coughs> excuse me, with the training of Zeus. Some key things that I'd already planned on. Now you can make plans with animals and their, their personality can be completely wrong. So some key things for sure. Now one massive, massive thing, if you're gonna train a golden eagle, you need to understand what the hood is for in full career. And you'd like to think, by the time you're training an eagle, you know what the hood is for. Now, I've got a Bedlington Terrier staring at me because I'm waving my hands around and he thinks there's food. There's no food. No, down boy. Stop knocking the camera. Oh, you're gorgeous. Stop it. The hood is massively important with eagle full curry. <clears throat> and I see people... Hold on. Go on! Away! Stop knocking it. Oh yeah, he's not very happy now. I see people, especially goshawkers, coming into eagle falconry. And I say goshawkers because very often the goshawk is a bird that people don't hood, falconers don't hood. They are tricky to hood, they can be a nuisance to hood, they can be a bit problematic hooding. And I would say in the UK, most people flying goshawks don't hood them. Um, I wish they did, but they don't. In fact, in the UK, if you're watching this from another country, most falconers don't understand how to use the hood at all. Be in my bonnet about that. If you think your golden eagle is going to be trained like your goshawk and not need the hood in England, you are setting yourself up for a massive fall. I see it every year. People take on an eagle, they have never, they've never hooded a bird, they don't know how, they haven't put the homework in, and they, they have a go and they fail, and they think they'll be okay without it because after all they've been flying birds for 20 years and they've never used the hood. It doesn't work for the eagles. Think about it, you've got a golden eagle, it is a massive long distance predator. These birds take on slips in other fields, not just at the end of the field, that may be half a mile across. These birds are long range predators, and they are soaring birds. They have got enormous wings for soaring. So when the wind blows, that eagle instinctively spreads its wings to pick up that lift. It's instinctive. You can't reason with it, you can't tell it off. That's what its nature's told it to do. Let the wind fill your wings and off you go. It's free, free flying. So what happens? You're not hooding the bird and the frustration sets in once you're out in the field. Number one, your eagle's not your goshawk. It's not looking for stuff quite close by, running around in brambles or bolting. 
or from the end of your dog's nose, the eagle is scanning beyond your distance of vision and it's capable and designed to take pursuit of prey at that distance. So your bird is baiting at stuff you can't even see. Baiting is trying to fly and chase that game. And you're not letting it go because you can't see what it's after. And it's not safe to do so with an eagle in England. We live in an overcrowded country and your eagle probably needs to be in spacious areas. And if you're letting the bird fly at stuff, you'll soon realize it's flying a long way away at stuff you never even saw. You want to know what it's going to be slipped at in the UK. We're not in the, the sagebrush plains of America where there's no people and endless space. It's completely different. So your goshawk that you got away letting go as soon as it baited and chasing what it saw because its reactions are 10 times faster than yours was mostly going for stuff quite close by. You're not going to do that with your eagle. I know your eagle hates you. Well, it doesn't hate you, but it's really growing a dislike for you because it's conditioned by you and by your training and by its very DNA to take pursuit of game running away. You're holding it back. It's hanging upside down from your glove. It's really cheesed off. And then when you finally do find it an appropriate slip and you let it go, the bird's exhausted. Those big wings and those big wing muscles are completely different to the blur, the vibrating blur of the goshawk's wings and the way they work. Your bird's exhausted and now you let it go. It doesn't work, but there's worse to come. It's a bird of open landscape. You're gonna be hunting over big, vast landscapes. They're always windy. What you perceive to be a day with no wind, you get out in the open and it's windy. And on a windy day, and these birds will hunt in near gale force winds, even on flatlands. These birds are masters of the wind. It's going to open its wings constantly. So this is the analogy. Imagine a fishing umbrella that will not break, going out on the hillside, vast open places, flatlands, in howling winds, holding that umbrella. You will be exhausted and cheesed off. Now give that umbrella a mind of its own, that it'll open and shut when it wants. It will dodge and it, it, this way and that, trying to take off into the wind. It is incredibly frustrating. It is massively exhausting. It pulls on muscles and joints and your bird feels exactly the same. It's designed to go up in the wind. Carry that bird hooded, doesn't happen. Can't see where it's going. It keeps its wings folded up. In the lashing rain, the rain runs off your eagle because it's not flapping its wings around, uh, around as well. Keeps it waterproof. They are waterproof, but the water runs off it. You can cuddle it when you walk in. You can hold it, you can support your hand because a well-trained eagle has no aggression towards you. You can carry it like this. You can support that bird. Stop it, boy. Absolutely different. You try and fly a golden eagle or a Benelli's eagle or any eagle you like in England on a windy day, without employing the hood, your frustration will grow huge. Stop it, dog. And the eagles will be dreadful. It will get so wound up. And again, when it does get time to slip, that bird's flat exhausted. It's been baiting for hours in the howling winds. You need to learn to hood. So Steve Hawthorne, at the time of the game, I bought a brace hood from him. You do need a brace hood for your eagle that it can't get off for sure, or a hood that it can't get off. Um, and then I used a John Mee slip-on hood for all other purposes, i.e. hunting and falconry. Uh, there's lots of fantastic hood makers out there. Of course, those that fly eagles are gonna make the best slip-on eagle hoods. They understand the purpose. Um, a, a complete reinvention of the wheel is Tom Carnion's new hoods because his new line of hoods are fully synthetic. That means that they can um, be produced in a way that they breathe differently, um, the, the, the hood breeze and the, the finish is completely out of this world what you can have on them um, so definitely check out his hoods as well um, like anything you can get a cheap a, I don't quite like the cheap Dutch hoods off eBay ridiculous it cost me nothing the good thing about a cheap hood is you can cut it around you can mess it around to make it fit or to, to change the fit and you can buy three or four if you have to they're not that expensive and then when you get one that fits once your bird's going through the training then you can approach the top quality um british hood makers and possibly get something not only top quality but you've kind of got a fit there you've got what you can say well this one fits perfectly something to work on because often when you buy a hood they don't fit always buy two or three at the beginning no so hoods massively important I wouldn't even, you, you can't consider Eagle Falker in England without a hood. It's, Americans watching this, your landscape, your population, it'll let you get away with it. I still disagree with your way of doing things. Flying Eagle out the hood is selective. And 
unless you've had got hardly any game, you can you can forget the ones the bird might have seen that you didn't, because with the hood, you can be really selective. Definitely, the hood's the way to go. Now, something else I gave a lot of thought to was housing and perching. Um, I haven't got a picture. I don't think I've got a picture of his housing on here, but I think you know what? I'm going to find one. I'm going to find one if I can and put it on here. So we wanted an outdoor area. So we had a weathering lawn with a block. So you see, he wasn't that keen on the block. He bait like the hooding quite a lot in the beginning because he would just bait endlessly. Um, partly, sometimes it's where the block is. You know, the birds like to feel secure, something behind them. Um, he's all right on a block. It's not his favourite. Uh, a half bow perch. Check out uh, Wurzel, the, the young bald eagle on, on a half bow design. That is a fantastic way to keep your eagles, certainly inside in a muse, because the way they slice and poo, it goes lengthways. So it's not going at the wall of the enclosure, at the back wall, and it is really, really tangle free. It's much better than putting a bow perch or a block in the muse. These things really work. Something we might go into the design of on another video another day. Um, half bow design indoors was his thing, and he had. Um, horse rubber matting, so he did bait, his, his talons weren't his nails, his talons weren't wearing down and then I'd cover newspaper either side of his half bow to catch the worst of the mutes and um, the slices of poo and clean that out on a daily basis in the morning and that was an, uh, an enclosed area so the perch with words will look at the perch but the idea of the setup was completely different. Zeus's was uh, plastic all the way around that you could wash down and keep nice and clean horse rubber matting, not the stuff with holes in, the solid stuff with dimples for him to bait onto to preserve those talons. And by far the key perching, um, the Europeans have pioneered this long ago, is the swing perch. Golden eagles adore a swing perch. Its potential for harm is great if you don't understand it and it's not built correctly. So look into swing perches, look into design. It's got to work perfectly and you've got to be around an awful lot in the early stages because they can't balance, they hang upside down. Once they get used to it and they know how to flick themselves back up, they can go to sleep on one foot on it and it's balanced perfectly. It's amazing to see them balance perfectly on them. They love them because seven foot plus up in the air, that bird can see a lot of stuff. So it can use its brain, it's being entertained what's going on around it in the distance as well. Believe me, don't underestimate the swing perch for your eagles. They are really top perching eagles. I love them. Zeus could be left all day, no problem at all. The way, but you've got to get it right. It's got to be completely tangle free, and the bird has got to be completely able to get back up, which means one thing, it's got to be fit and strong enough to regain a swing perch. Don't underestimate the dangers, but don't underestimate how much golden eagles love a swing perch. And of course, once the bird's trained, just like most other hunting birds, if you do your research and you modify it for that individual bird, you can free loft those birds, golden eagles, in an aviary with no problems at all. And you can have obviously free loft designs of perch as well. Um, Zeus has been free lofted uh, with no issues at all. Um, in the hunting season, I prefer to have him, have him tethered in a muse and, and out on a swing perch. It works better for me. Personally, uh, I know the people that have got their free lofts perfect and the eagles are feathered perfect in them and they fly and hunt out straight out of them. So fantastic. They can be free lofted for sure. One thing for sure, if you're going to use swing perches, you've got to understand them and you've got to make sure it's working and the bird understands it and it's fit enough to use it. Um, I've also kept Zeus for a whole summer on a, probably a 30 metre running line zip wire. My God, what we found this year. Kyle's flying Zeus. This is his eighth season as I'm filming this. Kyle, my son's flying him all of this season. I haven't got time with the new house and renovations here and at the Fulcrum Centre. But what we found out this year, he spent the whole summer on the zip line because he was flying actively much more than he does normally in the summer. He started the season way fitter, way fitter than he ever has. Do I therefore recommend you to put your eagle on a running line? Don't put any bird on a running line. That's all I can say. If your bird doesn't understand the zip line and you don't understand the zip line, there is a catastrophe for your bird waiting to happen. It wouldn't suit all birds unless you really know everything you can think about, everything, how it works and what can go wrong. And you and your bird can understand it and you can understand the setup. The setup. Do not use a running line. It is a disaster waiting to happen, but the irony is 
Zeus mastered it and it kept him super fit. Now another kid, <laughs> when dogs look at you like this, <laughs> come here. This old boy, let's go, let's swap to where I'm gonna go, because this old boy here, he's a nearly 12 year old Bedlington Terrier. He was my full curry dog, he's my wife's baby. He was my full curry dog for a long time. Hold on, no, we're jumping ahead. For a long time, because this boy here was fantastic. Bedlington Terriers aren't like other Terriers. Think of them as some kind of clever woolly whipping. He has a great nose and he worked for my goshawks fantastically for years. The only trouble with the Bedlington is a woolly coat. When it's wet on the oilseed rape in the winter, they look like a rat. It's my wife's rat and I dared not risk flying that underneath the gold league. I just dared him. It was sort of, he looked small and skinny, bite size. I just dared not risk it. So we flew with that dog for a couple of years and then when you're out, my full career, I prefer full career on my own. That's just me. I go out with friends, have a great time, but I prefer my full career day now on my own with my animals, my birds, my, my own team, one human. Much more peaceful in the countryside. You see a lot more and you, you're in there, you're zoned. You're in the zone because you're not talking, you're not thinking of anything else. It is purely full career. Um, a couple of years in, I thought, I'm going to try a dog. So we didn't, didn't have the dog when the eagle was a baby. We've got the dog once the eagle was up and running and hunting a couple of seasons in. Um, Elsie, Elsie, this girl here, come on. This girl here, I thought a German short head pointer. Nice and big, should there be any mistakes, probably survive the mistakes and not get eaten. And I have to say, not only is Zeus a good boy around dogs anyway, no problem, but this girl here, she's fantastic. Uh, just that, that, that cut above, that's, you know, Bennington Terrier is designed to get in there on his own and do the work himself. The pointer's designed to work under a dog, a, gun or, or bird of prey. The nose is outstanding, um, natural ability on this line, um, the Caton Valley line of pointers. Um, brilliant, brilliant dog indeed. Uh, did I train her? No, stop it Fed. I trained her to whistle commands so she obeyed certain commands. Natural ability, everything else, she did it herself. Pointing, I didn't teach her to point, she just did. And her job was to zigzag left and right on the whistle across the open field because when you're trying to walk up hairs on your own, it is very difficult indeed. Having a dog that will just happen to bump them up as it goes, fantastic. Um, altercations with the eagle. Um, she pointed and flushed um, Mudjack a couple of occasions. The eagle took pursuit and the dog did not stop on the whistle as she should. And the eagle literally clipped her as he flew by. Cartwheel the dog out of the way, literally. And he just carried on in pursuit. Um, the dog quickly learned that when I meant stop at distance, there was a repercussion if she didn't. Um, other than that, the eagle would fly straight over the pointing dog or the sitting dog straight over, no problems at all. Um, first season error, the dog uh, flushed what turned out to be a large rabbit, probably a, oh, 150 yards down the hillside from me, running behind a hedgerow, tree line hedgerow. The eagle gave pursuit, went over the trees and stooped. Now, what I couldn't see had happened is the dog had pinned the rabbit and got the rabbit. And the eagle thought probably the best way to secure the rabbit is to secure the dog's face at the same time. When I got there, the rabbit, I could hear it laughing in the distance somewhere, but it broke free and the eagle had got the dog. Now, of course, the dog's wriggling, the eagle's got fur in his hands. He was just in a fireball of, I've got food. Um, at this point, I can tell you now, having learned how to straighten the bird's legs to release its tendons, something I advise you to understand and find out how to do. Yes, you can straighten a golden eagle's legs and release its tendons, grip, because with a bird of prey, it does this to pull those tendons and pull those talons tight. If you straighten them and hold them straight, they release, and yes, you can do that with one hand on a golden eagle's legs. So, thank goodness. We managed to free the dog up. Eagle wasn't happy with me. It thought it had caught something. I'm kind of in there forcibly robbing it, but at the end of the day, I wasn't going to offer the eagle food to let go of the dog. Therefore, I'm training the eagle to catch the dog, and I hopefully would. So it went a bit funny. No blood from the dog, and being a bonehead, she was working straight away afterwards. But for me, I went home. Wasn't going to risk it. I really had only time. Only time we had a real bad location there. Um, and after that, they just work in a fantastic partnership. Indeed, there's guys in the States, they run sausage dogs under the undergrowth with their golden eagles. Your golden eagle has got a brain bigger than a harrisaur's brain. If a harrisaur and even a goshawk pea brain can work out that ferrets are not off the menu because they're helpful, of course a golden eagle can work out dogs are helpful too in the, part, in the hunting partnership. Now, when it comes to fitness, for me, 
my research, um, road work was key. So we we had the Eagle five days, fed it on the block, like I do with the Harris Hook, um, outside of me, manned the Eagle everywhere. I was taking on pest control jobs into busy lorry yards and everything, because I was hooding the Eagle, wasn't I? So I could back off, I could hood the Eagle if he was looking like he was getting a bit worried, and back off and then hood him. He could see everything. And in five days, get this, I thought, we'll try and hop into the globe on a short bit of clearance work. I was at a country show, and there was, uh, I was at Bath Racecourse actually, and there was a dog agility going on, 20 yards, not even that, 20 yards away, dog agility. People everywhere, golden eagle, jumped to the glove first time. Never been fed on the glove until this point. And came on the Koreans 12 feet straight after. No problem at all because I'd done the manning in the five or six days. He'd already feeding happily at home, out of sight of me. He was relaxed. Works great for Harry Swords and Golden Eagles. Bear in mind, Zeus is a parent reared golden eagle, not an imprint. My hunting birds, I've flown, I've flown got sorts of imprints and parent. For me, my great love for falconry proper, my great love is parent reared birds. It's a whole new topic we can go into, but not today. So this is really important. Zeus is a parent reared golden eagle. And at the early stages of training, a parent reared bird and an imprinted bird can be massively different. If you fly those birds for years, they converge, strangely. The, the good bits of the imprint, the parent reared will gradually take on, and the good bits of the parent reared, the imprint will gradually take on, and it will lose a lot of the annoying bits about being an imprint. So over time, they converge and become similar, but in the early stages, different birds. We're talking about parent reared golden eagle. So rope work. So I'm gonna let Kyle explain a bit about rope work. And as he says, it doesn't, it's not about heavy rope. All, all The only point of rope work is, it's not about dragging a weight, it's about having resistance so the bird can't flap its big wings and then glide to you using no muscle power. It's got to flap all the way. Just enough drag, it's got to beat those wings to get to you. Cardio builder, muscle builder, really, really important. Really important. For me, road work was the key because you're, you're getting, um, really interested in that response to the glove and it come any distance. I only use a 60 yard rope. You start winding up any more than that on your own at the end of a session and it gets a bit daunting, believe you me. 50, 60 yards, repetition, repetition, like going to the gym, utterly boring, building and building on it more and more. Um, golden eagles work for nothing. They work for the, site, the food of male household would work for. So typically for road work call-offs, I'm calling it to a day old chick leg. Seriously, they'll work happily for that all day long. They are amazing animals and they have a slow metabolism and they don't need a lot of food to stay on point, it's unbelievable. So chick leg size morsels, you can do lots and lots of repetition. Hope you've enjoyed part one of this video. Please go and check out part two, link in the description.